This evening, we count it a great privilege and a great honor. I'd rather be in my seat, but you all know how that works. But I was just thinking as we were singing that song, that is really dangerous words to say to the Lord, that you've opened all the windows and you've opened all the doors and to come inside. It's very dangerous words to say to the Lord unless you mean it, because when you say that, he'll do it. And we better be prepared for him to do that. So, but we know that we're gathered with a group of people that can say that from their heart. And that can say that and that can mean that uh, regardless of the, the pain and the consequences and the inconveniences that that might cause them. That that's truly their heart's desire. So let's take our Bibles and uh, let's turn to uh, Psalm 19. Thank you, musicians. We'll read a portion of scripture here and then let you have your seats. Just happy to be in the house of the Lord this evening. I have a thought here that I would like to present for the sake of a title. We're going to call it uh, The Weight of Ourselves. And we'll, maybe that'll be a little bit more clear to you once we get to these other scriptures, but the, the title would be The Weight of Our Self. And Psalm 19, verse 14, just one verse here, says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let's just pray together. Precious Lord Jesus, we just want to pause here a moment and thank you once again for this privilege to be here, Lord. 
Father, we hold these times very dear and even more so as time would go on and they would be more sacred to us, Father. May we never take it for granted that we would be able to gather together and to be able to see each other, Lord, and to physically gather around your word. Lord, we would just ask now that as we would come to this great juncture of the service, Father, Lord, we stand here as a man that is completely incapable of doing what's been tasked with doing, Lord. There is nothing good within myself, Father. There is no capabilities. There's no intellect. There's nothing that I have to present to the people to help them or to encourage them, Lord. But we just come here based upon your word and based upon a gift that you've placed, Lord. And we just ask for you to come and have the preeminence and do that which only you can do, Lord. For it's only the lamb that can take the book and to, and to loose the seals, Father. Lord, we just stand here as a vessel and nothing more. So we just ask that you would come and take the preeminence in both the speaker and the hearer and that your supernatural divine purpose for this service would be accomplished here this evening. We commit ourselves to you with thanksgiving in Jesus Christ's name. The bride says, amen. amen. God bless you as you would have your seat. So if you look at this portion of scripture, I started to title this, God Don't Stutter, but I uh, thought that might sound a little redneck, so I didn't title it that, but the psalm here says, let the words of my mouth and... So we immediately go to a conjunction. So it says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. So we realize that if that is the prayer that David is having here, he's saying, let the meditation of my, uh, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable. That means that you can actually have the right words coming out of your mouth with a wrong heart. And you could fool a lot of people with that. You might even fool yourself with that. But you can't fool him with that. So David recognizes this paradox that he's in, and he's, he's offering a sincere prayer to the Lord that I don't want to just talk right. I don't want to just act right. I don't want to just look right. But I want to be right. And I want my heart to be right. Because as much as a paradox is having the right words coming out of your mouth with a wrong heart, it's even more of a paradox. You can have the right heart and everything else be, be wrong and you'll still be okay. The heart is the important part. And the heart is what only God can get to. A minister can stand here, he can present the word, he can present the message, but the heart is something only God can get to. We can fool each other. We can fool the minister. But we, we can't fool God. And if we're his seed, we're not going to fool ourselves. He's going to let us know something's off. And this is, you know, this is heart, heart surgery as a figure of speech, but I guess it's applicable physically as well. But this is, this is a heart surgery of heart surgeries because, again, you can sit under the inspired preaching of the Word and you can look right, and you can act right, and you can even do right, but yet your heart won't be right, and only you will know that. And that would be an awful condition to be in, and only you would know that. Unless there is a gift that God would allow to come and speak to you to make that known, a gift of discernment or a word of knowledge or whatever the case may be, unless God would supernaturally come and bring that to your attention to let you know you're not fooling everybody, you could set in that condition. So... We have, we have to look at this very seriously because at the end of the day, if we're counting on anybody else but ourselves to get us right, it's not going to work because it's going to come to the point in time. Oh, here I go with the doomsday preaching already. <laughs> I made it about five minutes, so I'm improving. 
But it's going to come to the point in time, saints, that we're not going to have somebody to lean on. It's going to be an individual affair. It's going to be an individual walk. We're not going to be able to run and cry to the pastor. We're not going to be able to run and cry to another minister. We may not even be able to run and cry to our spouse. It's going to come to that time. And David, I think, recognizes this. And that's why he's saying, Lord, don't just let the words of my mouth be right. But let the meditation of my heart be right. Because David knows if he can get to that point that he's going to be just fine. So let's skip over, let's skip back rather to Genesis 26. And I want to look at a couple of scriptures here. I'll just be, you know, very, very opaque with you and, and very clear with you this evening. I've got two scriptures that I know that he wants me to tie together. And after that, whatever happens, happens. Um, so we may be here for 15 minutes. We may be here for three hours. I don't know. But I know that we're supposed to tie these two scriptures together and the rest of it's up to you all. So I would present that as a challenge. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not here with an agenda. I'm not here to present a thought to you or to teach you something. If you have a need from the Lord tonight, get it. Um, that's, that's all that I can say. So, um, you know, I, I stand here and, and I'll do my best. But, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's very clear what we're to teach and what we're to, what to present. And sometimes that does take three hours, as you all are aware, aware with me. But, you know, it's, sometimes it's just the direct opposite of that. Sometimes you have a, a couple scriptures and, and you just have to go with that. So we'll tie these together and, uh, and see what happens. But in Genesis 26, verse 12, we know this story very, very familiar because it, it speaks directly of us in our age. Uh, we know this is Eliezer going to fetch a bride for Isaac. But in verse 12, it says, And he said, O Lord, uh, this is Eliezer speaking, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. You'll notice the intent that Eliezer begins with. He's, he is asking something of God, but he's not asking it for himself. I wonder sometimes if our prayers aren't answered because we're always praying for ourselves. Brother Branham says a gift's not even for the person with the gift. But the gift... He said his gift was for other people. He said the same thing about Jesus, that he was there to serve other people. He says eternal life was living for others. I'm not saying we can't pray for ourselves. We should pray for ourselves. I do quite a bit of it. But I'm just wondering if there's not another channel that we should get into. And Eliezer is, is uh, representing that channel here to us. He is coming with a purpose. He is coming speaking to God but he's not even wanting anything for himself. He's wanting something for his master Abraham. So you'll notice that not only are the words coming out of his mouth correct, but the meditation of his heart is correct. This is not a selfish desire. To be quite frank, if Eliezer was selfish, he wouldn't have been, he wouldn't have been wanting to find a wife for Isaac because that diminishes his portion in the scripture. If he would really think about that, this is a suicide mission. Because once he finds the bride for Isaac, his, he's done. You'll notice Eliezer didn't have a problem with that. He wanted what his master wanted, and that was his prayer. Show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she shall, she shall say, drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for my servant Isaac. And thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. And it came to pass before he had done speaking, that behold, Rebekah came out, who was born to Bethel, son of Milcah, the, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher upon her shoulder. And the damsel was very fair to look upon. I want to stop here for a second and go back to this first thing, this, uh, 
this verse 15. I find this amazing, that, but as, and it came to pass before he had done speaking. I mean, this is a, this is a channel, saints. This is actually a millennial channel. Because in the millennium, we know that as we would think something and before we would speak it, the need would be met. Look at the position that he is in. Before he even finishes his prayer, before he's done speaking, this, these things start coming into action and this bride presents itself. And I would say that to bring attention to a fact that we have to be very careful of how we view the people that's went before us. Because we know as we're coming down to the very last closing seconds of time that there's been generations before us that never walked in the fullness of the message. They, ha- they received portions of the message coming down, but they, never, they don't see what we see. And some of them went off the scene by, the, by way of the grave. But you'll notice that God cared for those people so much that he put their place in the scripture here. Because there was a people on the face of this earth that before our prophet got done speaking, before his ministry ended, they were believing him and they were walking with him and they were acting with that. And God cared so much about that that he put that nugget in there. Because it would have been just as easy for the scripture to say, and after he got done speaking, that Rebecca showed up. But God laid that in there for that generation that went before us. So let's not be critical of that. Let's recognize that for what it was and be thankful for what it was. Because no matter what weight that generation carried before us, even if it was just a slight weight of holding that message up, it's allowed us to be in the position that we're in. And that was important to God. So much so that he would lay that type in there. And the damsel was very fair to look upon. A virgin, neither had any man known her. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. And this is the scripture that I'm basing all of this on that was just really caught my attention because whenever I see redundancies in the scripture, I know that God don't stutter. And he's saying something for a reason. So it comes here to verse 16, and it says, The damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin, neither had any man known her. So it begs the question, what's the difference? If no man's known her, she's a virgin. If she's a virgin, no man has known her. So is God just filling up ink blots on paper? Does he stutter? Does he think we need to hear it twice? Or is there something he's wanting to catch our attention with? Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. So we know that we're Rebecca in this situation so as Rebecca is coming to this well, she is, in, she is in a certain condition. And this is the same condition that we as the bride of Jesus Christ must be in in order to have, to meet Isaac and to go into the marriage. To be even called by the messenger, to be accepted by the messenger. And the condition that she came to that well in was she was fair to look upon, she was a virgin, and no man had known her. Obviously, there's children present. We're in a mixed audience. I don't want to go into graphic details there. But it obviously shows that a person, that that a woman can be a virgin and be known by a man. Think about how awful that would be. You come, you get married to a lady. You're there your first week. You go out to a restaurant and she orders whatever her favorite is. The guy sits down at the table next to you and he says, oh, I'm gonna make up a name, so Susie, I see that chicken and dumplings is still your favorite. He already knows something about your wife. See what I'm saying? 
that this woman is already known by another man. And we can go through a list of examples. I'm not going to go through that, but it, it may be what her favorite collar is. It may be whether she likes daisies or daffodils. It may be whatever, whatever the case may be. But the point is, Rebecca was not in this condition. Rebecca was not a flirter. Rebecca was a virgin and she had not flirted with any other man. There was no other man that knew her. There was no other worldly entertainment that knew her. She was a virgin and no man had known her. Satan did not know what her vices were. Satan did not know what her weaknesses were. She was in a pristine condition. She had not been out flirting with the world. She had not been out flirting with anything else. She was in a pristine condition awaiting the arrival of the messenger that would introduce her to her husband. So we, can, we notice here that there, is, there can be a difference because obviously the, the virginity, that is, that's a physical, physical act. So even besides of a physical act, that woman can be known. And like I said, what a condition that would be for a man to take, to take a wife and every, every man in the community knows every, all of her secrets and everything about her and what she likes and what she don't like. Known by everybody in the community, but yet physically, technically a virgin. See, this is the point that David was getting at with his prayer. David didn't want to be in any type of condition like that. He wanted his words to be right. He wanted his, his heart to be right. He wanted to look right. He wanted to act right. And he wanted to be right. And he didn't want all of everything on the surface being okay and underneath being full of adultery, being known by every vice that came along, by every tactic of the devil that came along, by every little switch and sway. He wanted to be in a pristine condition. So I feel that this, is, this was laid in the Scripture purposely because if you'll go to Hebrews 12 with me, Hebrews 12 and verse 1, you'll see that Paul picks this very thought up. So we've seen it in Psalms. We've seen it in Genesis. But now we come, we come to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, and it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, de despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So there in verse 1, you see Paul picks up this same thought, and he says, not, let's not just lay aside every sin that besets us, but he says, let's lay aside every weight so now, because he's differentiating between this, we can realize that you can be in a sin-free condition, but yet completely weighted down. Completely weighted down by the cares of the world. Completely weighted down by yourself. And that's where my title came from. Because, you know, this is a, this is a good scripture to preach holiness on, right? I mean, we could take this scripture and just, you know, as they say, shuck the corn with it. You know, preach, preach holiness good. But that's, that's not my intention here. My intention here is I want you to look at these scriptures because I think it's important as we move forward, we have to understand what's going on with us. Because I am thoroughly convinced that I'm standing before a group of people who is not interested in sin. But yet your trials, you and I both know, your trials and your tribulations are getting heavier and heavier and harder and harder and more precise and more precise to your breaking point. Why is that if you are free from sin? 
Because Paul says, let us lay aside every weight that so easily besets us and the sin. So he's, he, Paul is wanting us to recognize that there, there is a condition that we can come to as sin-free. And we know, as, we know that that is just unbelief. We can believe the word. We can be living the word. We can be acting the word. We can be talking the word. But yet within ourselves, within our DNA, with our, within our genetic hybrid makeup, there can be weights within that that can beset us and that can keep us from manifesting what Christ is wanting us to manifest and that can keep us out of the pristine condition that Rebecca was in. So this is, this is not you know, a scripture that I want to take and start hacking, you know, hacking holiness and you know, hacking away at Christ, our Christianity and you know, you know, making you feel condemned or bad. That's, that's not my intention here. My intention is just to make us recognize that there's two parts there. There is two parts. And I'm convinced, as I said, that I'm with a group of people who's not interested in living in sin. I'm convinced that I'm with a group of people who is seeking out any sin that would be in their life and quickly repenting of that and getting that out of the way. But yet things just get tougher and tougher and harder and harder. So we have, to, we have to stop and we have to recognize what is that that's pressing on us? If it's not sin, what is it that's pressing on us? And I wonder sometimes if that's not simply the weight of ourself. The weight of our genetic makeup. The weight of hybridization as it came, has come down through our family trees. And understand that these weights, these weights may have very, some of them may have very good qualities for certain situations. Certain situations, that quality that is there in your genetics and in your DNA can be very beneficial. But yet in another situation, it can be absolutely detrimental. And that's why we've got to come back to David's prayer to let the meditation of my heart be acceptable. Because we've got to recognize that something that with, within us, in our makeup, can be right. And it can be right. And it can be right. And God can use it here. And he can use it here. And he can use it here. And then all of a sudden, there'll come a situation here. And we'll find ourselves beating our head against a wall. Because we've leaned to our genetic makeup because we've seen it work and we've seen God use it and there's nothing wrong with it. It's not sinful. It's simply the weight of our self and God is going to make sure that he strips that away from us so that we do not lean on any of that and that we lean solely on him and that it's by revelation that we're leaning on him not past experience. So Paul clearly differentiates that there is a difference there. And he's, and he's doing that so that we would know. See, our, again, the situation we find ourselves in is unlike any other because it's, it's not just enough to overcome this age and to overcome Laodicea. We are in a position that we have to overcome ourselves even in a sinless condition. You understand what I'm saying when I say a sinless condition. We know that we're in hybridization and we're gonna fight that till the day that our atoms change. But as far as a desire for sin or a desire to do, to do wrong or being okay with that, there, that, that is not there. But we've got to move a step farther and we have got to examine ourselves. And again, that's going to be limited from a minister. That's going to be limited of how God can do that. That's going to be an individual examination. And that's the only way that it'll work. Let's go to Ephesians 5, 27. And you'll see this trend continue in the scripture. Ephesians 5, verse 27 says that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot, 
or wrinkle. Why is it so important that it don't have a spot or a wrinkle? Why isn't it okay just to be spot free? I mean, if I come to you and I say, brother, brother and sister, you are spot free, you would probably feel pretty good about yourself, right? But then I say, but you're full of wrinkles. Well, you just told me I was spot free, but you're full of wrinkles. But the scripture differentiates. So it's almost one of those things, it's like I'm just never good enough. I'm completely spot free. I stand before God. I mean, how many would like to have that testimony? I stand before God completely spot free. And he says, good job, now go iron out the wrinkles. But that's the point that we're called to. And that wrinkle is not a spot. The spot is a sin, the spot is a blemish. The spot is something wrong that needs cleaned out. The wrinkle, how do you get a wrinkle in a garment? By not using it. That's the only way to get a wrinkle in a garment. If you're wearing that garment, the wrinkles are gonna fade out. The reason we get wrinkles is our faith is not in action. The word is not in action. The word is not being worn on a daily basis. It's been folded up and put in a drawer somewhere and it gets wrinkles. That shirt may be spotless. No ketchup on it, no mustard, no baby slobbers. But if it's tucked away, folded up nice and neat in a drawer, what good is it? And when you get that shirt out in a spotless condition, it has wrinkles in it. That don't bother me, might bother some of you, but in a spiritual sense, that bothers God. Because he says, I will have a church without spot, without blemish, without a desire for sin, without sin in their lives, without flirting with the world. And she will be without wrinkle. She will be manifesting my word. She will not just be talking about it, She will not just be acting like it. She will be wearing it on a daily basis. There's only one thing that gets wrinkles out, and that's heat. I'll take that back. There's two things, heat and pressure. Heat and pressure. So I want to go back to what I was saying earlier. This is not to condemn anybody. This is not to rip anybody up one side and down into the other. This is to maybe help you understand what is going on and what is going to keep going on and get more intense with your individual walk. God is going to get the wrinkles out. And that is going to be heat and that is going to be pressure. And you will be in a sinless condition. When the heat and the pressure comes, what that's going to do is two things. It's going to drive you to your knees and you are going to make sure you don't have any spots on you. And then you're going to want God to deal with whatever wrinkle that is. And you're going to want him to iron that out as quickly as possible. Because the longer the iron sets on there, the hotter it gets and the more pressure it gets. That does not mean that you are in a sinful condition just because you are dealing with heat and pressure in your individual walk. You may be perfectly spotless before God and God is simply wanting to get a wrinkle out of that hybrid nature that has come down through your tree that may not even be any fault of your own. And, confusing as it is, that he may be able to use nine out of 10 situations for his glory. And it will be automatic to you and you'll never even think about it. But in this situation, you'll lean on automatic and you'll lean on your your condition, your genetic condition. And it's not him doing it, it's just your genetic makeup. And he won't tolerate that. That's not what he's after. What he's after is a complete surrender from each and every one of us that he is doing everything in every situation. 
So he will deal with those wrinkles. And a wrinkle, I can't emphasize this enough, a wrinkle is not a spot. So when the heat and the pressure comes, I'm not saying that we shouldn't go to our knees and we shouldn't check our life, because we should. We should, but after we have checked our lives and we've made sure there's not a spot there, quit dumping bleach on a wrinkle. It's not going to work. You don't need two drops of the blood of Jesus Christ. One drop will suffice. Don't question, do not question the integrity of your heart once you've checked it and once you've covered that with the blood. Brother Branham says so many times we get confused that it's God punishing us about stuff. And it's not that at all. He simply, as with Job, he was simply wanting Job to ask him a question. Job went through all of that because God wanted to ask him a question. God wanted Job to ask him a question. I mean, that's mind-boggling to us. But everything Job went to was to get him to the point that he would ask that question to God. So it wasn't that Job backslid. It wasn't that Job got out and sinned. Job knew where he stood. We should be the same. 2 Peter 3, 14, it says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. Without spot and blameless. John 14, verse 14 If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. And if ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Why isn't with you good enough? Why does he have to be in you? Or does God stutter? He dwelleth with you, and he will be, and he shall be in you. With you is not good enough, saints. With you is not good enough. If you'll go back to Genesis, you don't have to turn there, but if you'll go back to Genesis, that is actually the condition Eve was in. Because the scripture says that she took and she gave also to her husband with her. Adam being with Eve did not keep her. Adam had to be in Eve. That was the only thing that would prevent that. So now Jesus comes and he picks this thought up, this principle up. And he gives us a word for it. Because these conditions that we've just listed here of Rebecca being a virgin, neither had any man known her. Laying aside every sin and every weight. Being without spot, without wrinkle. Being blameless. These are not something that's going to be accomplished with him just being with us. This is only going to be accomplished by him being in us. You can look right, act right, and talk right if he's with you. But your heart will never be right unless he is in it. And you may be the only one that knows that. But he's given us a word to meet the challenge. He has given us a way to make that work. I will be with you, even in you. 1 John 3.18 says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us not, or I'm sorry, for if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence towards God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. This is a condition given to answered prayers. 
If your heart condemn you not, then we have confidence towards God. This is the scripture Brother Branham picks up, um, or the thought that Brother Branham picks up in perfect faith. He says, and now we're going to turn to Mark, St. Mark the 11th chapter, and we're going to begin to read about the 22nd verse of the 11th chapter of St. Mark. And many of you know this scripture, it's very familiar. It was the scripture I was thinking on when those squirrels, when he said to me about those squirrels. Those was the very scripture I was thinking about. It's been a puzzle. He said, if ye say, not if I say, but if you say. Now let me read, Jesus answering said unto them, have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea and shall doubt and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he ask. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. And when you stand praying, forgive, if you have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Yep. Now faith, this is Brother Brennan speaking, now faith is based on forgiveness then. So we just, we just had a teaching on how faith worketh by love. But faith, which works by love, is based on forgiveness. How profound that is. And it ties right into that scripture. If our heart condemn us, condemn us not, then we have confidence. See, if we have spots on our life, we're not going to have confidence towards God. We have to get the spots out of our life. We have to get the blemishes out of our life. We have to allow him to get those out of our life. But when it comes to wrinkles that are in our life, wrinkles on our garment, that does not need the bleach anymore. That just needs heat and pressure. And that needs a confidence towards God. So don't go back and start re, um, like I said, re-dipping it in bleach if you're trying to get a wrinkle out. Don't go back and start questioning whether your heart is condemning you or not. If your heart's condemning you, deal with that problem. But once you have dealt with that problem, we have to accept the fact that we now have confidence towards God. Because if, if his blood and his forgiveness is not enough to take care of that, if you repenting of whatever it is that he has checked you in your heart, if you repenting of that is not enough to cover that, I, I beg you to tell me what will. I mean, do we have a plan B? Do we have another option? Is there, can you fast long enough to make it go away? Can you pray harder or more or whatever the case may be to make it go away? Saints, if we get on our knees and we repent and we ask for forgiveness, we've got to leave it there. We've got to leave it there. Because as soon as you pick that up, John 14 will never work for you. John 14 will never work for you. And you will never get rid of the wrinkles in your life when you're constantly dealing with spots that don't even exist. You will never allow him to deal with the wrinkles in your life if you keep wanting to throw it in bleach and deal with the spots. Let the spots be deal, dealt with. Let them be in the past. God is not, I am convinced, I am, I am standing before a group of people that God is not interested in dealing with your spots. He's dealt with them, saints. I believe you dealt with them before you came through the doors. God is at the point he is wanting to deal with our very DNA makeup. He is wanting to deal with the very wrinkles that our genetics is throwing at us. And he is wanting to iron those out. And I'm going to tell you something, saints. You will never withstand the heat and the pressure that he is going to use if your heart is condemning you. You will go mentally insane. 
you will have an emotional breakdown. You have got to leave, as that song says, you've got to take it to the cross and leave it there. You have got to allow him to deal with our wrinkles and quit questioning whether they're spots or not. You have better get serious with him and deal with the heart issue once and for all. And once you've dealt with that, leave it alone. Allow him to use the heat and the pressure to deal with the wrinkles because that's what he's wanting to deal with. Brother Branham says, now faith is based on forgiveness then. And then, as we said this morning, trying to get the church into the place where we could really see the apostolic times moving among us, that's what we all hunger. And it's just laying right at the door. We see it. We want to see more of it. We want it in such a flow that it will be a help to us us flow out to others. Remember, Jesus never used his power for himself. He used it for others. That's what it was sent for. This is why it's so important that we deal with the spots of our life. We let them go. We allow God to use his heat and his pressure to deal with the wrinkles in our life. Because it may not really even be for your benefit. This is a body move. It's an individual walk, yes, but it is a body move. And God is going to use your brothers and your sisters to iron out your wrinkles. So this goes back to John 14. How can God use your brother and your sister to iron out your wrinkles when you saw them do X, Y, Z two weeks ago? Are they forgiven or are they not forgiven? Brother Branham says faith is based on forgiveness. That is forgiveness for you. That is forgiveness for your brothers and your sisters. Because that is the very tools. Like it or don't like it. It doesn't matter to God. That is the tools that he is going to use to iron out your wrinkles. He is not going to come down on a cloud as the fairy tale picture cloud. You understand what I'm saying. He's not going to float down on a cloud, wave a little magic wand over you with a little nice iron and softly pat them out. It's going to be the body that he has chose to come in. It is going to be the form he has chose to come in. We know what form that is, saints. We can't understand it. It's a paradox, yes. But your brothers and your sisters and you are the form that God has chose to come in. That is the form that he's going to use to iron out your wrinkles and my wrinkles. His blood will take care of the spots. I don't need you for my spots. His blood will take care of my spots. But there are things that are so ingrained. I'm just being honest with you. There are things that are so ingrained in my DNA and my genetic makeup that I think they're right, and everybody else is looking at them and be like, that is so far left left field, it's not even funny. Saints, it's our genetics and our makeup. The Scripture says every man thinks in his own eyes thinks he's right. It is going to take a brother and a sister who is honest with us to be able to identify that and bring that to our attention. Instead of getting angry about it, we should be thankful. If you've got a brother or a sister who will be honest with you, you should be thankful. Get mad at them if if you want to for a little bit. But at the end of the day, you should be thankful that God has allowed a form to be on the face of the earth that will bring you into a perfect condition. It's the form he's chosen to use, saints. Allow him to use the form that he wants to. That is the form that he will speak to us in and that that he will bring to our understanding wrinkles that are in our makeup. It's so important that we, that we have faith in that. And there's no way we can have faith in that if we don't believe that those people are forgiven, if we don't believe that we are forgiven. And forgiveness does not take a long time. We're all well aware with with the story about the, the little girl in the prayer line who smoked cigarettes. She's in the prayer line. She's a smoker. 
She repents of it. She stands before the prophet, and he cannot see it. That's how long it takes. How long a time span you want to put on that, I don't know. I'm going to say maybe a nanosecond or less. But it's a real quick process. So now, if the prophet tries to rebuke her for that, he's telling God something that God has already forgot. So now God thinks his prophets went insane because he's trying to tell him this little girl's got sin in her life and God has no idea about it. That's how it works, saints. You'll not understand that, but you have to accept it. You have to accept it. It's the only way. As, as the pressure in your and my individual walk increases, it is the only way that you will keep a sane mind. You have got to accept what he's done for you. You have to accept it, and you've got to leave it there. And you have to accept that for your brothers and your sisters as well because God is going to use our brothers and sisters in a way moving forward, and he has been, but even more so moving forward to get the wrinkles out of each and every one of our lives. We've got to have confidence in that process for ourselves and for our brothers and sisters. Brother Branham says in the Church Age book, we need to call on God for revelation more than anything else in the world. Very, very familiar portion there. But look at what he says after that. We have accepted the Bible. We have accepted the great truths of it, but it is still not real to most people because the revelation by the Spirit is not there. The Word has not been quickened. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21 that we have become the very righteousness of God by our union with Jesus Christ. Did you get it? It's, remember, this is right, this is the first thing he says right after he says, we need to call on God for revelation more than anything. The very first thing he goes to, that we have been made the very righteousness of God by our union with Jesus Christ. Did you get it? It says that we are the very righteousness of God himself by being in Christ. It says that he, Jesus, became sin for us. It does not say that he became sinful, but became sin for us, that by our union with him, we might become the righteousness of God. If we accept the fact, and we must, that with him, I'm sorry, that he literally became sin for us by his substitution for us, then we must also accept the fact that we, by our union with him, have become the very righteousness of God. Listen to what he says next. To reject one is to reject the other. To accept the one is to accept the other. So it's not optional. It is not optional. If you are trying to accept the fact that, I mean, just the gospel in its rawest, purest, simplest, that he became sin for me and was nailed to a cross and shed his blood for my salvation. If you accept that fact, you must also accept the fact that you are now spotless, blameless, wrinkle-free, the very righteousness of God. To reject that is to reject the fact that he died on the cross for you. And I know that's just, you know, if we want to say Christianity 101, but that is it in its raw form. If we're going to accept one, we have to accept the other. If we reject the latter because of our DNA makeup and how we just can't wrap our mind around that and how we failed, you know, 14 times two weeks ago, to reject one is to reject the other. And the reason that that is so important is if you can't accept one and you can't accept the other, you will never accept the form that God has chose to come to you and I in, in this day. And you will never accept the form that he is using, that he is trying to use to get the wrinkles out of our life, to get us to perfection. Iron sharpeneth iron. That is the form he's chose to use. We have to, have a, we have to have a complete confidence 
in what the prophet says here if we're to move forward as he's wanting us to move forward. To reject one is to reject the other. 1961, Revelation chapter 5. The first part of that series, Brother Branham makes a statement. He says, and so many times we hunt for God and we look for God. And if God was just everywhere, and if he had a great big throne sitting up here somewhere, everybody would believe in God then. If God set up on a big throne here somewhere, say he sits in this certain, certain city, and here he is. This is God, and you go to him. He can just turn it like that. Why, everybody would believe him. This sounds like a wonderful thing to me. This is what Job was wanting. Remember, this was Job's prayer. He says, if there was just a man I could find, if there was just a man in flesh, if there was just a man somewhere, if there was just some way I could contact him, if I could just lay a hold of him, if I could just tangibly find him. This is what Job was after. This is what Job was looking for. Job just wanted to make direct contact with God. Brother Branham says, everybody would believe him. Then faith would be void. So as wonderful as that would be, and as much as I would like that, it's impossible for God to grant that to us because that would not be pleasing to him. Because the scripture already says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith worketh by love. Faith is based on forgiveness. Faith cannot have a God sitting right there on a throne that I can go to and he can snap his fingers and make everything work okay. There's no faith involved. And for this little hiccup that's in time, that is what God is after. He is after faith. He is after faith. That's what he's after. He says, we wouldn't have to have any faith at all then, you see. That would be that. This is my favorite part of this quote. That will be in the millennium. Praise the Lord. Let's just stop reading there and let's get to the millennium. But now he's calling and trying to find out those who... It looks mysterious and dark, and you don't know how to do it. Maybe I'm the only one in that condition. Maybe I'm the only one that's ever experienced that. It's mysterious. It's dark. I've got no clue how to deal with this. That's the people God's looking for. But by faith, we believe it. We believe that's the reason this is. So if you take that quote and you take that back to the scripture in Ephesians, it's in Ephesians 5, 27, that he might present himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle. Amen. How is he going to get a glorious church without spot or without wrinkle. He's calling, trying to find out. It looks mysterious and it looks dark and you don't know how to do it. But by faith, we believe it. That's how he's going to have a church that's without spot and without wrinkle. Is he's going to have a people that have a revelation of God's love to them that their faith will work by and they will understand and have a revelation of forgiveness for themselves and for their brothers and sisters. That's how that's going to work. That's how that we are going to be able to get rid of the weight of ourselves, which is the weight that's holding us on this earth. He's dealt with the sin problem. We have got a full word, and a full word brings deliverance for any kind of sin. We have the word in its fullness. We, we have no excuses for sin. We have the full word. We believe the full word. 
Remember, sin is just unbelief in the Word. If we believe the full Word, why should we question whether we have sin in our life or not? It's not that we're not going to make mistakes. Repent of them. Wash the spots out. Let Him deal with the wrinkles because that's what He's wanting to deal with. And I think I've said it a hundred times now, but understand how He's going to deal with those wrinkles. You don't get to pick how He deals with the wrinkles. And unfortunately, we don't get to pick how long the iron sets on there. We don't get to pick. He's the one with the iron in the hand. He's the one that's going to move it back and forth. He's the one that's going to decide how much pressure it needs on there. The point that I'm saying that is I don't want you to beat yourself up or question where you stand with God when the heat and the pressure comes. It's going to come. It's not God being angry with you. It is God simply wanting to iron out a wrinkle that you may or may not even know exists in your life. You may not even know the wrinkle was there until everything's said and done with. Again, look at what Brother Brandon says. He says, it looks mysterious. It looks dark. I cannot see what's going on here. But I have to have faith in the one who has the iron in his hand. I want to look at something real quick as we would come to a close. We're very familiar in the scripture that God has seven compound names. The seven compound names of Jehovah. And we know that the seven compound names of Jehovah are found in Jesus Christ. And we know that the fullness of the word coming in our day and our time was to manifest the fullness of Jesus Christ. So therefore, by default, the fullness of the word being manifested in our day and our age is going to manifest the seven compound names of Jehovah. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide a sacrifice. I'm going to give a disclaimer before I go through these. I'm probably not going to pronounce all of these correctly. You can look them up yourself. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide a sacrifice. Do we want that manifested? Do you know what that means? Yeah. Yeah. It means you're at some point in time going to need a sacrifice. That's not going to be a pleasant experience. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healeth thee. Do we want the fullness of the word manifested? Do we want Jesus Christ on full display? Do you know what that means? Maybe I should have titled this sermon, Do You Know What That Means? That means at some point in time, you're going to need a healer. Do you want Jesus manifested in his fullness? Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is present. Do you know what that means? That means most likely when you're getting some of those wrinkles ironed out, you are going to get to the point you question where in the world is God? Is He even here? Do we want Jesus Christ fully manifested? Do we want Jehovah Shammah manifested? Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is our peace. You get my drift. Do we want it manifested? Are we opening the doors? Are we opening the windows? Do we really mean what we say? Remember his name, which we took in baptism, his name is his characteristics. It's not just a verbalization. David picked that up. He's, see, David said, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. See, you can be dunked in the pool however many times you want, and Jesus Christ verbalized over you however many times you want. But his name is his characteristics. And if you've taken his name in baptism, that's a public declaration that you want his name manifested through you. 
do you know what that means? Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is our banner. That means you're going to be going into some wars. And you're going to need him to fight those battles. That's what that means. Do we want Jehovah Nisi manifested? Do we want it manifested in its fullness? Because you realize what that means is you can't fight that battle. See, most of us, a lot of us, myself included, we're okay with the battles coming that we can handle. That's the spots. That's not what he's after. What he's after is the wrinkles. What he's after is the condition that you're going to be put in that you can't fight that battle anymore. And now he has to manifest on your behalf. Nine of the ten battles you might have been able to fight just fine just because of the way you're made. Number 10 will totally destroy you if you, try to, if you try to rely on yourself. You will come to the point that you need Jehovah Nisi. Jehovah Reha, the Lord is my shepherd, as the musicians come. The Lord is my shepherd. Oh, that sounds so nice. That's wonderful. Do you know what that means? That means you are going to come to the point that you finally recognize you have absolutely zero ability to lead yourself. Do we want the fullness of the word manifested? Do we want the fullness of the word manifested? Jehovah Tiskanu, the Lord is our righteousness. That means at some point in time, you're finally going to come to the recognition that everything that you've got to offer is nothing but filthy rags. We know that intellectually, but do we really know it? Brother Branham says, we know the Bible, we've read the Bible, we know these things, but the revelation of it is lacking. God is going to make sure that the revelation of it is not lacking. Are we willing to allow him to do that? Do we want that fullness manifested? Do we know what that means to us as an individual? Do we really want to be free from the weight of our self? The paradox of that is we can set and we can ask that question and we can say yes because we really don't even know what the weight of ourself is yet. It's going to take conditions to bring that out. Do you understand what I mean? We are undoubtedly, each and every one, I'll just speak for myself, sitting here with conditions in our life that, we, that we're completely wrong in. I mean, completely messed up in, completely wrong. A situation will arise and we will handle it completely wrong. And we'll be like, why in the world did I do that? But it'll be that condition that he will use to bring us to the recognition we still have a wrinkle there. So it's, it's almost like a catch-22. We can ask that question and we can say, yes, amen, that's what I want. But when it comes... When it comes, as, the, as time is fading out and the heat and the pressure is so intense, when it comes, these seven compound names are going to start being manifested. And that's not going to be, none of these are pleasant conditions, saints. Here I go with the doomsday preaching again, sorry. But, but none of these, understand, none of these are pleasant conditions, but yet we have them laying in our life and, and a lot of times we're completely ignorant to them until a condition arises that brings them out. Right. And that's what's forthcoming. That's right. And that's what he's after. And that's when we're really going to have to ask ourselves, do we mean what we say? Do we really want the seventh seal revealed? Amen. 
do we really want the fullness of God made manifest in my flesh? It's a tough question. It's going to be tough situations. None of these are going to come with easy situations. It's impossible. These are tough situations. These are characteristics that are only brought out under tough situations. And I'll just want to leave you with this because this is, this is really what I want to emphasize. Rebecca came before Eliezer and she was a virgin and no man had known her. Just because things get tough, just because things get hot, just because things start squeezing, just because it's an intense pressure, that does not change the fact that you are the spotless, virtuous, sinless bride of Jesus Christ. Allow him to iron out the wrinkle, saints. That does not change your position with him. Allow him to do what he wants to do in the way that he chooses to do it. And this is going to require faith. To reject one is to reject the other. To accept one is to accept the other. Let's just pray together. Precious Lord Jesus, we just want to pause here to end this service, Lord. And thank you for your word, Father. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for these things that you have laid in the scriptures and in the message for us. That as we would come to the closing moments in time, that we would have an understanding, Lord, of what is going on around us and even more importantly, what is going on within each and every one of us. Lord, and as you have laid out these, these requirements in your word for your bride to be spotless and to be blameless and to be wrinkle-free, we recognize, Lord, that there's no way we can meet those conditions. But you would quickly come and you would lay another word in there that, that I will be with you and even in you. Lord, and it's to that that we look. And it's to that that, that our faith is in and our hope is in, Lord, because we don't have any other option. Lord, we recognize the seriousness of what you're wanting to do and what forms you're wanting it to do it in, Lord, of hybrid flesh that, that is not made to withstand the pressures that are coming, not made to withstand the trials and the tribulations that not only are coming, but that we're going through, Lord, and that we have going through. Lord, we are, we are incapable. And I think that's what you're wanting us to understand, Lord. May we come and may we die afresh and may we, may we remember the name that we took when we got buried in baptism before you, Lord. And may we have a fresh understanding and a fresh recognition that we didn't just take that name verbally, Lord, but we took that as the characteristics that you wish to display through our flesh. And Lord, may we accept that and may we allow you, even as confusing and as dark and as mysterious as the situations may be, may we allow you to manifest the fullness of your name in us. Lord, for we, we know that we have a promise once you do that. Lord, and it's that promise, just as Jesus despised the cross but endured it for the promise that laid ahead, it's that promise that we endure these things that we look forward to, Lord. Lord, we look forward to that millennial reign, Lord, once you have accomplished what you want to accomplish with us. And we give ourselves completely over to that, Lord. We pray that you would just take these words, Lord. It's not been presented in a dynamic way, Lord. I don't want to, to fake dynamics or enthusiasm. It's a serious thing, Lord. But we pray that you would just take it 
and make it a reality to myself and to the people, Lord, that we would manifest that which you desire. We thank you for this time, Lord. We pray that your blessings on the people. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. God bless you, brother. Go ahead, brother. Jehovah Jireh, I master at doing heart surgery. And then I marvel when I watch God work. And what I see, you know, we talked about preeminence. And we talk about the second fold of the great threefold plan of God. And that second fold was to have preeminence in a people. And he's doing that now. But that means he wants to have preeminence in me. And preeminence means absolute control absolute total control and that's what God's doing he's working it all out to where he gets absolute to total control that we don't just have a knee-jerk reaction and do what we've always done but that he takes control and does what he wants in every situation amen he's perfecting his bride he's using all the circumstances around us to perfect his bride but I say God have your perfect way in me amen I I'm I'm tired of myself amen I'm tired of the weight of myself, amen? And I just, if, if I just had a switch where I could just flip it off, I would take the switch and I would flip it off. But God hasn't made it that way. He wants it under his control. And I say, praise God. We've come to this life for training. We've come here training for reigning. We've come here to learn about God. We've come here to understand what the seven redemptive names of God are all about. Amen. Because we would experience it in the negative to watch God come through on the positive. I say praise be to God. Man, when he was talking about the nature, I started thinking that, that quote we hear so many times, your greatest strength is also your greatest weakness. And I was thinking while he was, while he was ministering there about a police dog. A police dog is aggressive, right? Do you want an aggressive dog as a police dog? If you're going to take down a criminal, he's got to be aggressive. He's got to have grit. He's got to have determination. He's got to be a little bit ferocious. And you breed that into the nature because you want that nature because he's going to face down a criminal and have to bring it down. Amen. And, and that's a wonderful thing. They bred it to get it that way. Amen. But they don't want that police dog dragging down little old ladies and little kids and you understand, I mean, we, the, the, that trainer wants a certain thing in that dog, but he wants that under absolute complete control because he, well, there's got to be a mind, a greater mind that can discern a situation that can bring that nature under control so it's only used the right way. And God has put so many ingredients in us to get us a certain way, amen, bred it into us, amen, but that thing without control can be the very thing that will destroy everything around us. 
It'll destroy situations and destroy relationships. And the very thing that God wants to use for his glory can absolutely be destructive if we're not in absolute control of the Holy Ghost. And so there's times that he'll let us go ruin something just so we'll end up hating everything about us and saying, God, you've got to take control of us. I don't know what, I don't know what to do. I don't know which end is up. I don't know what to do without your leadership. How many of you can say, God, I want you to have control of me? I want you to, I want to know when you say go, I want to go. When you say stop, I want to stop. I want you to have control of me. Amen. I think that's what preeminence is all about. Just appreciate the word. I appreciate the sincerity. I appreciate the depth of an individual walk where God will come down and start dealing with this individually when nobody else around us will understand what we're going through and understand what God's teaching us because the lesson isn't for them. It's only for me. And if I tried to explain it, you, it won't even make sense to you because what God is doing is working something out in me and I know exactly what he's doing and I can't even get anybody else to understand it. That's how personal this is becoming. I say, thank you, Lord, for dealing with me as an individual. I want to go back, and I just jotted down a note. It's something that I found interesting. Back early on when he talked about Eliezer's prayer, how it was a selfless prayer, and he was praying for somebody else, and how God answered that. Before he was even done praying, she was on the scene. And it just reminded me of a testimony that I just saw, just I think just two days ago. I was watching uh, Brother Billy Paul's testimony. And in Brother Billy Paul's testimony, he was talking about they were out camping and Brother Billy had been really nervous and he was, having a, he was nervous and he was struggling with his nerves from the meetings and they were out grilling some steaks and Brother Branham knew that he was nervous and he took his hat off just for a second and prayed and he put his hat back on and Billy noticed him doing it and, and Billy said he ate his meal, he felt good and after the meal was over, they were sitting around talking and Brother Branham said, now you all know Billy's been real nervous. He was nervous when he got here to camp. And he says, I, before we ate, I just prayed a little prayer and asked God, Lord, would you bless Billy and help him to enjoy his meal, enjoy his time here? And that nervousness and that, and he says, you saw what a big meal he ate. And Brother Billy said it went, he, was, he enjoyed himself. He said, then Brother Branham pulled up, took off his boot, took off his sock and pulled up his pants and showed a great big black and blue swollen ankle. He said, a week ago or, or more than that, he said, I sprained my ankle real bad and I've prayed for it every night since then and it hasn't got healed. And he says, see, that gift is not for me, it's for others. I thought, what a testimony. Here, the prophet, I mean, You've been there where you've prayed day after day, deliver me, deliver me, deliver me, and nothing moves. But Brother Branham couldn't doubt the gift. He couldn't doubt his, who he was in Christ. He couldn't doubt his salvation. He couldn't doubt that he had a gift of healing for the nations, peoples of the world. He couldn't doubt his commission. He couldn't doubt anything. Even though it wasn't working on him, he was being tested to have faith. It was still a gift for others. Amen. Maybe sometimes what we need to do is quit focusing on us. Amen. Quit worrying about what we're going through and just start praying for somebody else. And if that other person will start praying for us, maybe the gifts are here for one another. Just let it crisscross all over the building, all over the body of Christ. Amen. I'll pray for you and you pray for me. Amen. I've got confidence in your prayers. I've got confidence in the gifts that are in you. And I've got confidence in who I am in Christ and it's for a person. And I got confidence if I intercede on your behalf, God will meet your need. But when it's not working for my ankle, I can't lose confidence that I can still pray for you. And if it's not working for you, don't you lose confidence that you can still pray for me. We're here for one another. I just thought that was a good testimony. I just want to say I love you. God bless you. Amen. God's going to have preeminence. There will be a bride under complete control. There will be a bride Amen. When he says sick him, she'll go after that devil, sink her teeth in and not let go. And then when she's faced the next, the same devil the next day, she lunges to go after her and he says sit and she'll sit. Amen. There's going to be a bride under complete control and God's working it all out right now. And I say, God, just have me under your control. Lead me by your spirit. That's all I want is to be pleasing to you. That's all I want is to be pleasing to you. Amen. God bless you. We love you. Let's just, let's just dismiss. Let's just sing a song. Yeah, let's sing a song. He's got a constant theme. He's got a constant theme.
got it all in control. He's got it all in control. He put that reassurance way down in my soul. He's got it all. Father knows what I need. My Father knows what I need. In everything I go through, He knows what's best for me. My Father knows. my life in His hand. I put my life in His hand. Every road I walk down, I know is in His plan. I put my life in His hand. He's got it all in got it all in control. He's got it all in control. Put that reassurance way down in my soul. He's got it all
the grave.